<laughs> Testing one, two. There may be too much audio going to the net. Brian, just tell him that. A lot of younger people are looking for the instant information. They want to get on Ancestry. They want to click the leaves. They want to acquire the information almost right away. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to get back to basics. And we want to include, at the beginning of all the meetings, kind of a 10-minute. We used to do a pass it on, but nobody ever stood up and shared anything. So now I'm going to pick the most boring topic on the planet that I'm no expert in, and I'm going to start to recite that unless somebody gets up and interrupts me. So we did. And he's now, just for the couple minutes it took, he's like, okay, maybe we should talk a little bit more. He's like, great idea. So that's what it's about. Just talking to people, just, you know, saying, you know, it's not all the click of the leaf. It's not all on the internet. We, everyone in this room can prove that and ha has seen examples of that. One thing we did, uh, I was reading a blog the other day, and everyone's getting into it. There was, uh, was a blog, was it Kersey's from England or someone else's blog? There was an article about everybody is getting into genealogy in some way or fashion in concern to business. They're trying to become the researcher that you can pay, and they charge good money for it. And um, so. Everybody's getting into it. The problem is, is we've got to get down to the local. And that's what this branch is about, is about getting down to the local. Um, Lois, sorry to pick on you, Lois, but Lois is working with the West Lincoln Historical Society, right? And they have newspapers there that they're one of a kind. Uh, what What's the name of the paper? The... The Smithville Review, and they're back from 18, okay, oh, okay, I'm sorry, so early 1900, they're the only copies in existence, and if I remember the, uh, the conversation we had, 
they were picked out of a recycling um, facility. That's how they recovered them. They were moments from the shredding machine that they recycle newspaper with. And somebody just happened to look down, wait a second, what are these? And pulled them out. So now they're sitting in, in West Lincoln. So that's what it's about, about us getting to the local level and trying to knock on some doors and seeing what's in basements and, and, and stuff like that. And again, we need to remind people that not everything is on the internet. We'd like it all to be on the internet, but it'll never get there. What were they saying? Does anybody remember? Last time I heard it was something like 1% is on the net. And it's ridiculously low. Somebody said five? Okay, so the number is tiny. It is. There are lots of organizations that are getting on board for digitizing. The equipment uh, is readily available. We have two of the scanners, and that's what's helping that. So next slide, please, Mark, if you would do me the favor. Okay, I'm going to see if this works. But I wanted to share this. This is kind of getting back to the basics. And some of you folks may have seen this, and some of you folks may not. There should be a play control on that. Do you see that or no? Reach. Nope. Just click right on there. Let's see if it'll. Let's see if we can get audio from the computer. And if we can't get it, then I can narrate. Fairly easy. This young lady was uh, with uh, was with uh, Joe and I in Ohio. We went for a course, and this particular headstone is zinc. It's a zinc headstone. It's a metal headstone, and they don't have that many, but they do have them down there. And what she's describing at this point is there's bolts right here that you can unscrew. And if you take it off, it's hollow inside. And inside, during Prohibition, they used to hide the liquor in there. So they'd say, go stop by you know, John Smith's headstone and you'll get your bottle. This headstone, it's hard to see. It's unique. It's got the last name Stephen. You notice that, Tyler? Um, this headstone is from the late 1800s, and it's in excellent shape. The only thing that happens with them is that they're, they're pre-capped, so they split. They tend to split right down this way, and they'll come apart. But it's in excellent, excellent shape. Yes. Yeah, she wouldn't let me unscrewed. I was sitting there going, come on, and she's like, no, 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 no. She didn't want me to take it apart. Joe was pushing from behind, but I'm like, but it was quite unique. And you could, and she said even the uh, the little kids would hide their jacks in their ball, like the ball of jacks. They would hide them in the headstone and leave them. No, the whole thing, the whole thing from here all the way to the top is zinc. So. The nice thing about, well, except for this part here, but the nice thing about it is, is you unscrew the nameplate and you can make like hundreds and hundreds. Of them. You know I mean, so if they figured out, like that's right into the material, but you know I mean, you can make hundreds of them and just prefab them. And all you have to do is make the plate. So yeah, if you ever see a zinc headstone, unscrew it. You might find a real old vintage inside. On two of the four in. There's two in Don Reach? Oh, there's four. Okay, so there's four of them in Don Ridge. And I do know, and I can't remember the cemetery, it's in Niagara on the Lake. We've got a cemetery video of it, but there's a zinc beds. They're full beds with like the, the head roll, and there's dirt in the center where you can plant flowers. They're all metal. So they're out there. They're just very unique. And of course, when the war come along, anything like that, just they needed the metal for everything. So uh, you won't find anything past uh, World War, World War. 
So, next slide. I just wanted to share that. Try that. Just double click. Yep. Okay. Just want to give you an update. Some of us went to conference. I know Tyler and Tim, uh, myself, my wife, Sharon, Brian, Mark, Joe, Cheryl, Lois. Did I miss anybody? Mike in the back. Actually, I need to make sure people know who you are. We had an excellent opportunity to go to Barry and uh, a conference. If you've not been to a conference, you cannot get that level of, of genealogical help and support that you'll you can get anywhere else. Um, you get to meet like-minded people, and we're all a little touched about our genealogy. And there's lots of us, you know, and we can talk and talk and talk about genealogy. That's what I ended up happening, and I got dragged to dinner a couple times. There's always someone who can answer the question. I don't think there was a question that left unanswered, or if there was one, somebody will get back to you. Uh, access to the top-notch speakers and leaders in the industry. Like, we, uh, Christy Gray from England, um, we had kind of an after uh, banquet kind of party up on the fifth floor, and she was right in there. And it was a fantastic opportunity to meet her, to understand her, and all the speakers. Uh, Thomas, uh, make sure I say his last name right, Thomas McGee, McGinty, thank you, uh, from the U.S. Very friendly, very nice. Uh, Dick Doherty was there. Um, so if you don't have an opportunity, just so you know, next year it's in Toronto. And I'll tell you, they've taken the best out of 2014 and the best out of 2015, and they are it's going to be an amazing conference. Uh, they've got lots of things uh, on the plans already, and they're already calling for speakers. So if you're interested in speaking, it's a great opportunity to connect. Is that the last slide? Is there one more? All right, give me one more. All right, last thing we want to do, in September we're going to roll it out. We've got an actual organization that's going to talk. And if you do a, a an alt tab, the web page should come up. Nope. Right. There we go. What we want to do starting uh, in September, but I'll give you a little preview of tonight. One, two, genealogy, not everybody, all their family is in Niagara. Some people don't have any family in Niagara. I think you, you don't have... There you go. So, but Maryland has family in other places. So what we want to do in, in, in September, who's, who's talking in September, right? Is it the Quebec? The Quebec Genealogy uh, Society is going to stream in for just 10 minutes and just give a wee little talk about their organization and different things that they can offer to people here in Niagara. So up in uh, Muskoka, Perry Sound, there's a genealogy group because OGS doesn't have a branch in that area. So this branch, uh, this group, has built that void. So they were a fantastic group to talk about. Uh, my wife and I went up in the summer because her uh, grandfather, who's a British home child, came through Muskoka. So we're on the trail, and we will be uh, working with these folks to, uh, to see if they can provide you information. So that's one of the things that we want to, uh, like I said, get back to the basics, get people to understand why we're doing this, and it's a learning experience. And we're hoping to expand a little bit more in September with uh, Pelham Library. I'm still speaking at the Pelham Library. Next one's in August. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but it'll come out in a, in a weekend. You know. I mean, uh, tons of people know. And um, it's a great opportunity that we're thinking that those meetings can help people on uh, August 11th. That they'll come to a break. So, um, that's what we're trying to do. So, is anyone... Yes. 
How about if I give you a mic so the people online can hear you? Yep. You can stay there. You just keep talking. Okay. Um, I had uh, my wife's relatives um, owned and operated a, um, a lodge on Otter Lake, just south of Perry Sound. And um, I was updating some of the my family history, and I did not have the date of death of her uncle that uh, was up there. Uh, but I knew that uh, he had been interred in the Foley Township Cemetery. That was the best I could remember of the name. I got on and Googled the Foley Township Cemetery and came up with a Foley Memorial Cemetery as a proper name. I went to the site where it was listed, and I think it's through that genealogy group in that area. And, uh, you know, they've got the select the letter you're looking for at the top. It was F for Franco. And I clicked on it. And within two clicks, I had the beautiful picture of his headstone with all yeah. the dates on it. Just as, as quick as I just related it, that's about how long it took me. It was great. Yes. End of story. Thank you. And that's what we want to hear. Thank you. you can just... We had another email that came in uh, just this week. Again, same story. Uh, gentlemen, I think I forwarded it to you, Joe. Uh, a lady was able to obtain uh, family's headstones through the Canadian Headstones Project we're doing. Um, I, I just recap that. We've got a volunteer in Victoria Lawn and Mount Osborne that are putting head, uh, headstones on the website right now. So Mount Osborne's in Beamsville and Victoria Lawn. Everybody knows it's here in St. Catharines. So uh, monstrous tasks. They're both huge cemeteries. So um, just before I intro, uh, or the, uh, pass it over to our speaker, because not everybody wants to listen to me all night, is there something you want to share? Is there something you've discovered and it, it's a great opportunity that other people may want? And I know Fred's sitting there going, pick me, pick me. How about it, Fred? You got something you want to share? Yes, I will. of the church, someone had discarded, of the names of the young people from the church, from the parish, uh, who had uh, joined up in the First World War. What church is that? Uh, St. St. Mark's in Niagara yep. Lake. Okay. Okay. Um, we've had it cleaned up and had it rededicated on Sunday, and Donald and I put together uh, a bit of a biography, as much as we could find, on each of the individuals on that plaque. Not being satisfied with that, we then went and included three additional names that are on the cenotaph in town. And then we went to Queenston and recorded the names without doing research on each of them uh, on, on the uh, cenotaph there. And then Donald went through the cemetery in Niagara-on-the-Lake and looked for anybody who was a veteran of the First World War. Uh, we've discovered two more, at least since then, that we didn't find. But we've listed their names anyway. So anybody doing kind of initial research and as somebody from this area uh, in the First World War, they might be interested in picking that up. It's available in the museum in Niagara Lake. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Anyone else got anything that's happening in the genealogy world? Or everybody's just trying to take it easy? Well, then I'm going to pick on a few people. That's all right. I'm good at that because I'll pick on myself. Marilyn and, uh, Marilyn and Morris Gom are working with the uh, Canal Memorial Project. They're doing all the research, verifying that uh, we've got death certificates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and new newspaper clippings, monstrous job, monstrous job. And they've been working very diligently at it and leading the way um, with that. Um, let me see here. Who else I got? I got Mike in the back. Mike Quackenbush. Did I say that right, Mike? All right. Mike is with the Hamilton branch. He's currently the Hamilton program 
uh, coordinator and the Hamilton secretary. So we welcome Mike, and he's got some great skills, and uh, he's probably going to get signed up for a few more things after his performance at the meeting last night. <laughs> yes, and the, the British home child treasurer, who my wife managed to uh, get in there. So uh, my wife, again, is the British home child chair. Um, we've got Tyler, who's now, uh, again, been reconfirmed as a director on the OGS board, and the branch liaison. Uh, so, um, he assists branches and their executives in, uh, solving issues, communicating. I'm, I'm working this way. I'm the last, I'm, I'm not really that important. I want to make sure everybody else is before me. So, uh, Tim is our Niagara, uh, treasurer, but he is now on the provincial finance committee. So he is going to be helping, guarding, and watching, and trying. We'll have to figure out how we can spend our money without him noticing us. <laughs> and our speakers are here. Nancy's doing with the newsletter. Um, I think it was an absolutely fantastic newsletter, and um, we thank you for doing that. Uh, who else we got? Lois is working with uh, other heritage groups. Sandra is with food, the most important part of the night. Uh, who else we got here? We got uh, Sharon, who's our secretary. Mark and Brian, oh, just so everybody knows, this whole room, I walked in here at 5.30, this whole room set up. Those guys right there, they do it. So we appreciate them. Cheryl is our librarian. Joe is our cemetery coordinator, troublemaker extraordinaire with the cemeteries. And Greg is just a handy guy to have around, and we're working on a, a job for him. He won't go that far. Um, and as well, I've been, um, I'm now director of, of the OGS board, and um, we'll see how that goes. I have my first meeting starting tomorrow night, and I may have run. <laughs> I haven't quite figured that part out yet. <laughs> yeah. So with that, we need to get the speaker wired up, and if we can uh, kill our PowerPoint, and we can get theirs up, and I will help. And I'll give you a uh, your intro in yourself from what I was told. Time to take that hurts. Later on, you realize that uh, it looks as though it just come through the first, second, and third Peloponnesian Wars and lost them all. So, yeah. Oh, well, that's not. You should have told me. Uh, there's another one here, but it's the same kind of thing, eh? Yeah, I mean, work. Sure, promise? This, this is, some people give Mickey Mouse presentations. I give Minnie Mouse presentations. I had to buy this. It was so cute. I think it's called marketing. It's also called royalties for Disney. Buy Disney shares. You can't go wrong. Now, this is Murphy, 
in all his glory. It used to be, you know, if you've gone through this whole thing of slides, oh, we've got it, we have contact. Uh, just to make sure I'm at the right place, it's OGS, but it's Niagara. Sorry, my apology, but it's at St. Catharines. Today's June the 11th, and I'm me, so we, we've got it all here. Now I've just got to get some magical okay. clicker. This, this is, you know, the CBC has things like this. <laughs> Forward and back. Okay, forward and backwards. Well, first I'm supposed to tell you about me. Uh, okay, what do you want to know? I'm a chartered accountant. Don't like doing tax returns, haven't done them for years. I do our own. Uh, I'm retired. You'd never guess, but I'm retired. Uh, I'm a history major. Uh, my wife and I are both collectors. And so we are, we are to genealogy like the Olympic circles, they overlap. So we are part of genealogy. What we collect is, is sort of some of the primary source material that some genealogists out there would love to get. But we don't know who they are. We just happen to have the stuff. And so we're into, I'm, I'm an ocean liner person. Judith is Niagara on the Lake and Niagara Camp. And so we, we do overlap. Uh, Fred, there was, Judith has a great postcard, which did show to one group there. And it's, it's a picture of the cemetery at St. Mark's. And on the back, and this is about 19, early 1900s. And it, it was written to this woman. And it said, hello, mother. Uh, when I see this, I'm just thinking of your birthday. <laughs> and I thought, this isn't a very nice thing to say to your mother, is it? I mean, <laughs> here's the cemetery, mom, and I'm thinking of you. Happy birthday. So, but, but it's the backs of the cards that are interesting. So she's that, I'm ocean liners. When it gets to Niagara camp and the first war, uh, th then we sort of overlap ourselves because Judith has Niagara camp. I have how these folks got to battle and how they got back again. So it, it's, it's really a continuum that starts with at Niagara camp, even pre-First War, and then goes on through coming back after the war and the ship that brought me home. So that, that's really the, the thrust of, of the talk tonight. Uh, the material we have, it's ours. And somebody made a comment to you about copyright. Well, I, I write a lot as well. And I, I have a column, for example, in New England Antiques Journal called Ephemera Detective. Uh, I'm on the board of the American Society and the British Society, and it keeps me out of mischief and off the street corners. Uh, but I'm, Ephemera is this broad heading that includes postcards, death records, any, anything that's written, printed or written on paper. So it, it gives a really broad scope for collecting, but to meet some really interesting people. We don't collect what you collect, but it's another genre and they brought sort of a new perspective to it. So you're always learning about these things. So I'm gonna just fasten your seat belts. I, I was told, well, you're, you're being live streamed. Uh, I said, it's quite all right. I'm not gonna say anything politically offensive, uh, immoral, inappropriate, or anything else. If you were here for that, sorry. Uh, <coughs> sorry, folks, on live streaming, that's your problem too. Uh, but what I wanna do is just go through this and, and start with the strength in 1913. So here the war is about to start. What do we have? 3,110 men and 684 horses. So we were a 684 horsepower organization. Uh, there was an authorized active militia of 74,000 men, 16,000 horses. And, and this is key for when they got to Europe. They were trained for defense on Canadian soil. That's a key word, defense. They, they, they weren't, and Canadian soil. <clears throat> 1913, 59,000 of them washed through Niagara camp, uh, or washed through camps. Some at Niagara camp, Petawawa, and later Valcarche. So this is the kind of numbers we're mm -hmm. looking at as the war starts. There was 
a requirement here, and uh, I've talked to people who, they were in Cadet Corps or in the state ROTC, that sort of thing. Uh, the Militia Act uh, said if you're Militia City Corps, 16 days a year of training, and at least four in summer courts, because you had summer, summer camps, because you had armories and so on in Toronto, like the University Avenue armories, Fort York armories. Uh, rural units, because they didn't have the local facilities, 12 days a year at camp, four days local. So, so think of these, because those days in camp, some of them were at Niagara camp. And so let's start at Niagara camp. Pre-war, here's 1907. The uh, uh, signal car and Butler's barracks, Niagara on the lake. So pretty clear as to uh, what we're, where we are and what we're doing. Postcards like this are great because they have a caption. They have mem messages on the back, and you'll see a few of those too. And that's where the genealogists need to be able to find these cards. Uh, my wife was recounting before the meeting about she went to a postcard show years ago with me and said she said she looked out over all these old men, generally men, going through postcards. It's about as thrilling as watching people at a stamp show, uh, going through postcards and thought, what am I going to do all day? So she sat down at one dealer's table and looked at the letter I. Iroquois, Iroquois, right. That's where her mother, grandmother was from. The family roots were in Iroquois on the maternal side. There's just a few postcards, they're not common. There's this 1909 postcard sent by her grandmother. And with a little note, what was it? Yeah. Do you see anyone you know in this picture? And it was a picture of one of these, yeah. So, you talk about the hair on the back of your neck standing up, boy, that really got me going. So she was hooked on, post she suddenly became a postcard fan. And, and at the end of the meeting, I've got a handout just if you decide you're going to pursue this postcard thing. Now, Judith didn't find that many more family ones, but what she's got is the story of Iroquois. So if, if you wondered what the town was like, what your grandparents saw, where they worshipped, where they posted their letters. It's all in these cards. It's fabulous. Uh, we were down there, saw the people at the library, and they said, we put the cards. There's over 100 of them. Never seen these before. The library has, because it was one of the towns that succumbed to the St. Lawrence Seaway, all they have is post-1956. Nothing before that. They don't have those cards, so we, they'll get some of it soon. Back to back to Niagara Camp, 1911. Uh, love these. This is a real photo card. The 97th Regiment Band at Niagara Camp, and you see these people. You know what really strikes me with these is these people aren't there anymore, and they're they're somebody will have a relative. They're looking. They're researching that was in the 97th Regiment. Well, they're gonna be in this picture, and if you have family sense, you might be able to narrow it down to a few people. That's 1911. From a local postcard, here we are, 1908. Tis camp time here now, and a busy time for everyone. But we enjoy the excitement and the band music. Nearly 7,000 men in camp this year, a great many out through the country every day, but they will all be gone by Saturday. This is read the back of the card because we have the person to whom this was sent. We have names, but we don't know whoever it is. 1910, Chippewa steamer at the Young Street Dock in Toronto, soldiers embarking for Niagara Camp. Postcard dealers have an interesting uh, filing sequence. This one wasn't in Niagara Camp. It wasn't in Niagara on the Lake. It was in 
Toronto because it was there in Toronto, soldiers blah, 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 going for their one of their summer spells. So there they are. The message is home. I'm over here for a week with the Queen's Old Rifles and having a fine time. This is the boat we came on. More of these family messages. And we, we loved these. They, they give you a feel for what it was like. But here's another one. You know, getting there ain't half the fun. Arrived safe in camp, had a rough trip over. Everyone was seasick on the boat. This is on Lake Ontario. It rained all day yesterday, so we did not drill. I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> there is a canteen in camp, but it is dry. And this is from E. Dudgeon, 7th Battalion, Company 4, 13th Platoon, Niagara Lake, Ontario. And so we know the name. We know who said it. Do you have a relative surname, Dudgeon? This is something he probably sent. And so here, 1908, artillery camp. So all this was happening before the first war. Uh, but these troops were being trained for defense on Canadian soil. 1906, camp conditions. Dear sister, I'm sending you this card to tell you how I am getting along. I am getting along fine. The boys are all fine. Bill and I bunk together. There are six in our tent, and they are all nice and quite, I think he means quiet. We're having a real good time. Goodbye. Uh, you send this home, of course, to assure them that you're, you're, it's all right. Now, you may be slogging it out in the mud. You may be having a terrible time, but you, you really don't want. More likely, these guys got away from home and had the time of their lives, even though the camp canteen was dry. There, there's places in town that probably did just fine out of that. But then war descends on us. And the German pre-war propaganda is, is really, you, you've got to appreciate the whole context of what this does to the guys who have a nice time coming to camp for their week of training. Uh, in, in Germany, uh, I brought a couple of things here. I just better pull them out and have them handy. That and that. Oops. And that and that. And that. There'll be a brief pause. For station identification. There. Uh, whoops. This is the. Uh, this is the uh, publication, and on the back was this highly inflammatory. With the British bulldog, here's the king being pushed by a woman. Votes for women. So the suffragettes were winning. So th this is what the German soldiers are getting. So here we have our new recruits. You took you, that expression, and I was part of it in Cadet Corps, awkward squad. Uh, <clears throat> these look like awkward squad. And they're in civilians. They're, they're just starting to get trained up. And then, but at war, here we are, returning to camp, a warm day at Niagara. And you know, if your ancestors were involved with training at Camp Niagara, you can get a few cards like this and say, yeah, that's the kind of thing they were doing. Now I'm, I, now I'm in context, that term. Now I know what they were doing. I've got a picture of them, but there's a picture of the kind of things they did. And I think that's more and more of the story. Machine gun skills. It bothers me to just the thought of training someone to fire machine guns and mow people down. But this was war, and machine gun officers and instructors, Niagara on the Lake, I love it when these are dated. So this is October 19, it's a little blurry, 17, I think. And lots of hard work. But you know, we talked about horsepower. There it is. Uh, there's a an archive that uh, is not in the museum yet. Uh, and it consists of 19 photographs from the first war of a Toronto person who trained at Camp Niagara, uh, but he was with the Army Veterinary Corps. He looked after horses. And there's shots of all his photographs. And this was a dealer in Toronto that had this, and they were training to go to Vladivostok, to go to Siberia, 
uh, in 1919, 1918. And they never made it, but their shots all the way, and there's the boat they didn't quite go over on. And so you think, this is some family's history. The names are there, everything's there. And, but it's horses, the whole thing ran on horses. Uh, this is great, but this was the canal. They had a core of people who guarded the Welland Canal. There was reference to Welland Canal history. This was picked up at Lakeshore Antiques between St. Catharines and, and Niagara on the Lake. We were in there one day and saw this and said, oh, okay, I think, talk to Richard Merritt, who's the quintessential expert on these things. It's actually in his most recent book uh, because this was guarding the, guarding the canal and they, these fellows ferried around to various spots. Uh, but they were, this was the ultimate nobility. Uh, beyond horses, you had this. You could see the chains on the tires, the dog resting in the sun underneath. And this was probably an itinerant photographer who would line up, because we saw another one similar to it uh, in another source, someone sitting in this car getting his picture taken. And you would sell this to, here you are, here's your picture. Uh, that'll cost you 25 cents and he buys it it's one of one there isn't another one so uh, these are fascinating as collector items uh, you want to send a note to the folks at home so again you're looking at the home side of things the recipients are we downhearted no niagara camp 1915 and this looks to me like it, it may be uh sort of crossing the uh, uh, Lake Ontario, but a great shot makes people feel good, and they've sold. They sold obviously. I would think a few of these. The home front, again picked up locally. Here's uh, Canadian patrol, the British Grenadiers, Drum and Bugle March, Rule Britannia. Oh, what a song! I love it. Highland Laddie, the Maple Leaf, God Save the King, and it's published in Toronto. So this. This is something that, again, your ancestors, First War, they would have bought things like this. You would have sat around the piano and sung, sung these songs uh, on, a, on, a, on a night. As in pre-TV, pre-much a radio, uh, you, you did your own entertainment. Uh, on the way, here we go. 1950, Niagara Camp, uh, bidding the troops farewell. And you, you see them heading off. They're hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. And it's a, a propaganda kind of card. You know, you, you just know that this is produced for people to send to tell the folks at home, some of your ancestors, that it's all right. Everybody's happy. It's a wonderful experience. And it's, uh, it's something I enjoy finding. You don't find many of these. They're, they're hard to find. Uh, now, en route, postcard. Once again, the back of the card. It was sent to Miss Gingel, Gingel, Grant Street, Toronto, Ontario. I haven't tried to find this person because I don't need to. Uh, posted at Quebec 1915, the message. Dear Daisy, I left Niagara 8.30 a.m. Friday morn. Land at 11.30 a.m., left Toronto 12.30 p.m., landed in Montreal 10 o'clock p.m., boarded the boat right away and went to bed. Boat left the wharf, misspelled, at 6.30 Saturday morning, and we have had our breakfast and are going down the St. Lawrence River when I am writing this postcard, and we have had a good view of Quebec. I will let you know my address later, because he has no idea where he's going. Uh, I will write again soon, love to all and love to find something like this. This tells you what it was like. You get camp, you move quickly, you move quickly again, you move quickly again. You, move. you don't have time to get scared or think or wonder what's happening. But if you, again, had relatives that were involved with this, uh, that's the kind of thing that happened to them. You were just swept up like a vacuum cleaner. Subtle messages, I'll go back one step. The language of stamps. See that stamp? It's upside down. 
On the same way there was a language of fans, a language of flowers, there's a language of stamps. And so were they really out of it and they put the stamp on upside down? I doubt it. Because there were subtle messages in these languages of stamps. Uh, there's all kinds of variations, but the upside down can say, I am not free, or uh, on an angle, my heart is yours. When shall I see? All, all these things have these subtle messages. But the only thing is, if everybody knows what the language is, it's about as subtle as a kick in the pants, because they know, the post person knows, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So it, it probably you think you're the only one that knows, but everybody else has a pretty good idea. Uh, first convoy. So we had those basic number of basic trainees. And by October, October 14th, uh, largest fleet of liners across the Atlantic at one time, 33,000 troops on board. Now to muster 33,000 men between start of the war, August, and October, and get them on board those ships. Amazing feat for, for Canadian military. And again, cards. Here's a lovely cancellation. Stamp collectors kill for cancellations like this. Canadian Overseas Expeditionary Force. Wonderfully clean mark. And when you read the message, just went to Blenheim. And there's a few cards that I have that went to Blenheim. This is another view of the fleet prior to it sailing from Gaspé Bay. The Franconia, which was what he was on, I guess, is with the bunch to the right, <clears throat> but I cannot locate her. She is a similar boat to the one with two funnels seen on the left, the second one, and busy with a letter for you, uh, getting it ready for next mail. Uh, some of these cards <clears throat> are, are more than just cheapies. Uh, that was the $35 card about 20 years ago. So if you have really good cards, uh, they do cost a bit of money. <clears throat> the ships, and again, this is the way your folks from Niagara Camp and other camps got there. Sailed from Canada October the 1st, <clears throat> within two months of war breaking out. Escorted by three cruisers, three second class cruisers, one cruiser, and here's all the ships. And if you go through that, there are, if, if you have relatives who came to Canada by ship, uh, Grampian, Saxonia, Andania, Virginia, Corinthian, Arcadian, all these ships were ones that <clears throat> were the means of getting people to Canada. Home children, that's the way they came. There's a, a uh, box of, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, Niagara on Lake Museum, uh, upstairs in storage, and it was a uh, a home child that came over on the. I'm looking for it down the list here. Was it the Scotian? It was an Allen liner, and <clears throat> it, it's right on there that this was the ship and their name, and they went to Miss Rye's place, and so it's. Uh, there were 33,000 men, 8,000 crew, and 7,500 horses. Uh, one of the problems they had was it hadn't occurred to anyone that there would be horses. They were just providing men. <clears throat> so there had to be some juggling around, and there were some losses among the horses because the, the food for them, the stabling, everything uh, wasn't entirely prepared for. And then there was these escorts, the Great War. And these were the, the uh, escort ships. So the voyage is over. They, they've gotten to the ship. Another card, Amherst, Nova Scotia. So some genealogist down there is probably looking for Miss Annie Balmer, uh, wondering what there might be from Annie's background. Well, here it is. I am on this boat sailing along at the rate of two and a half miles an hour. There are about 2,000 men aboard. Uh, now, this ship, it, this was somewhat well over capacity. Passed submarine <clears throat> uh, a few months ago. 
Uh, some of our boys are real sick already, and we are only about 100 miles at sea. So think of the trip over. <laughs> uh, everything you could ever think about happening. But it, it's not just you're not going over for a vacation. You're going over to fight a war, and you have no idea, no idea whatsoever what this is about. So think back as you research these people who fought in the first war particularly, uh, you've got to have enormous respect and love for them, for what they went through. So here was the Corsican, this ship. It carried 2,000 men uh, as a civilian ship, 1,000 in third class, and then a few in second, a few in first. So they, they'd sort of uh, stack them like cordwood, as they tended to do with these ships. Uh, in the second war, uh, the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth could take 15,000 men at a time. <clears throat> Again, stacked almost like cordwood, but it, you had to get people there. Another element of this was the Lusitania, and I have a particular thing about this. Uh, again, part of war, sure. Uh, you've got the people who say, well, you know, my relatives were on it or didn't go on it because they missed it by a day. Um, but it was those dreadful Germans and uh, innocent women and children. Uh, well, I have an example. One of our ships, the Allen Lines Hesperian, was sailing at the same time as a civilian passenger vessel, just like the Lusitania. And on the back of this postcard, posted at Quebec, Dear Gwen, just a few lines to let you know I am on board the ship now sailing up to St. Lawrence. I have not got a very pleasant cabin. It is a dark one. It is all soldiers on board, but we stop at Quebec to take on a few passengers. So in other words, it was a bloody troop ship, it appears. But it was sailing as a civil. But it got, nine days later, the same submarine that sank the Lusitania sank the Hesperia at a, a, just about the same area. And so can you say that U-20 and Captain Schweiger uh, were bad people? Uh, I mean, first, he was just following orders. But secondly, if there were military people, things on board the Hesperia, you think there wouldn't be any on the Lusitania? I don't know. I know it's a it's an ongoing debate. And at one stage, no one really wanted to know. It wasn't politically convenient. Anyhow, here we are. These liners, the other ones, were at war. So you've got, here's the Aquitania, uh, really one of the major ships, that Halifax. Uh, people love cards like this. It's You see the photographer. You see the venue. It's Halifax. And you can see this ship is in what was called Dazzle Bay, which was a way of disturbing submarines because all they could see was these ripples and it could be waves it could be it was hard to hard to aim supposedly uh, with this dazzle paint on and this was one of the classic four stackers and there are people in uh, certainly in Niagara Lake who came over on the Aquitania after the second war she was being used as a, a, a war bride ship as partly troop ship and then uh, people with, I think it was called assisted passage. So government sponsored you leaving to go to Canada or Australia. And so they, this was one of the ships. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's the, it's the only major liner that sailed in both wars. And she had the record for Cunard service until QM2 uh, passed it in 2006, I think was when they were on it. Uh, so it's, it's an amazing ship. More dazzle paint. Here's the Olympic, which I, it, I find it really confusing, but there, there were people who designed these patterns to confuse. The Olympic was our major Canadian troop transport during the first war. It took more of uh, that sister ship to the Titanic, I might add. 
but she lasted a longer time. And here she was with, for example, the seventh battery siege artillery going to England. And you would get this card, send it home, of course, because you're fighting for peace, justice, and freedom. God save the king. Lovely patriotic stuff. Here she is with the soldiers viewed from a seaplane on war service. Uh, peacetime, 2,600 men. Uh, wartime, probably double that. And you can see the dazzle paint here. Ephemera. Uh, locally, we got this, uh, picked it up, and the uh, it was out of an estate from Toronto. Uh, Mrs. The, the Naismith family. And so you're saying so? Well, there's some leads here. Uh, 2810, again, there are advantages to the internet because I could find that HMT 2810 was the Olympic, but it was His Majesty's troop ship or transport actually. Uh, so this was 1916, 8.30 p.m., a concert for Siemens Charities. Well, the, the person that was uh, was the, the Naismith family, and, and he was in the army, uh, and normally wives didn't travel unless you with you unless it was this fairly senior officer. So what I did was uh, looking at the Naismiths, I took an old friend of mine called the Blue Book. And you may know this book. Uh, the Blue Book is sort of Toronto's social register. This one is 1913. There's another one I have, Montreal and Ottawa. If you're trying to find people, beautiful, it's alphabetic. It tells you, as this example will, uh, here's the Naismiths, uh, 14 Maitland Street. Their summer residence is Ancona Point at Bob Cage in Ontario. Uh, and then 70 is the club to which they belonged in Toronto. Number seven belonged to a different club. Uh, you know, the York Club, the Granite Club, the, you know, all the right clubs. Uh, Mrs. Naismith, 111 Heath Street West, uh, and the people who lived there. These books are fabulous uh, because if, if you're looking for a name and they, anywhere near Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, in this era, uh, 1915, 1913, uh, they're great books. I'm just going to leave them, I'll put them up here if you want to take a squint at them afterwards just to see how much they have. I mean, they're, they're, we, and we bought these at a, a book fair and they weren't they weren't a hundred dollars. I mean th th it's not major money. Uh, and as you know Toronto refugees uh, we applied for refugee status at the Niagara border and we were granted status. Uh, we, we still have sort of an affinity for Toronto and two grandchildren there. <clears throat> but but this is the kind of thing you can get out of that book. Uh, I did it just to try the Naismith, tie the Naismith name down, but there's a lot of other names in there that are well worth looking at. Uh, another piece of ephemera. Uh, here was on the Ivernia, December 5th, 1916, breakfast. Oatmeal, porridge and milk, fresh bread and butter, coffee, dinner. Pea soup, corned beef, dressed cabbage, jacket potatoes. Tea, stewed prunes and rice. Got to keep them regular, you know. Uh, fresh bread and butter and tea. And this was it. Uh, what's amazing about something like that, this is going over. How many soldiers would keep a copy of a menu on the trip going over to Europe and bring it back with them? alive. I mean, I, it's just mind-boggling to me. And uh, so when I find something like this, which isn't very often, it, it is like the proverbial pot of gold or the jackpot. Or I, I've used uh, um, sports uh, terms to describe it. There's home runs, triples, doubles, singles, walks, hit by pitcher, which is something you take, but only if it's five dollars and it's it's sort of marginal, but what the heck. Uh, <clears throat> this is a home run. Over there, and we get over there, 
this is a card that Judith has uh, in the Canadian camp, a football match. We've seen this variations of this image, uh, but it's a, a, a card for the, for the uh, Canadian forces, and it's one of a series of cards. This is one that is a fabulous real photo card. Uh, it's the YMCA Niagara Camp Football Championship, 1916. And it is a, it's a real photo card. Uh, it's, it's right at the top of, of what you'd expect to pay for a postcard if you ever found it. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's just a great, great, great card. In England, this is, again, amazing. And you have to look at stuff. We picked this up in town. So it's fused from Folkestone, but it's YMCA camp. So there, there's a building there. And here you've got these officers standing around having a puff. And we got this, we, look, we saw this and said, eh, eh, eh. Judith did a little digging on it and found that there was a flap that had opened up. And there were views of different snippets of places. And a message on the back, it was sent to the falls, to a recipient in the falls. And the message was, was really great. It gave you, again, another perspective. And we have the name, we don't know who. who you know, someone's looking for information about them. Uh, 1918, April 18th, dear babe, I wrote here yesterday and I'm sure I will not have anything to, to, to say today. But I got a letter from Carrie, and when I was answering it, run across this cart. I bought it when I was in Sandling, some pictures of Sandling, and just thought I would write for fun. I received Carrie's letter, wrote on the 28th, have not received the box she sent me on the 6th, nor have I received any mail from you since the 11th of March. This is April 18th. But you've got to realize, this is their one lifeline. Mail is their one lifeline to home. And you can tell from his terminology that they're desperate to hear. Uh, I am or was working today loading bread, 25,000 loaves. You got to feed the troops. Old man Witt's son and I will have a feed for supper as he was working in the store and came home with a jar of jam. <laughs> he one stole jam, the other stole bread. Ha ha, some life. I would rather have a chaw mine and a bottle of fillers or FWAS, whatever the heck those are. I don't know. Well, babe, this is one day in the first in a long time that it has not rained, but it is cold as the devil. Well, bye-bye, a real letter on a postcard. <clears throat> Think I'll quit and go and write someone about mail. I never seen any of these places on the other side of the paper, but want to get it out of my way. <laughs> Obviously, a man of very much to the point. Bye, Earl. And we have the name of, of the recipient of this, the surname. But, you know, we could, the family could find this so they could, they could find us. But you talk about down to basics. This isn't on the internet. None of this is on the internet. Uh, you got to actually get down and dirty and look for stuff. Uh, that, that's how you find, further to your earlier comment, that's how you find the real gems. Everybody can find the stuff on the internet. He found this, and, and we're sharing it this as we like to do. At the front, entertainment. The game picked up locally. Uh, the Dumbbells was a, a, an entertainment group, uh, fabled in story and song, that went to entertain the chaps uh, at the front. And a little controversial, they came back and they did shows uh, in, in Canada after that. They were a Canadian group, uh, particularly because uh, Ross Hamilton was a kind of cross-dresser uh, in an era where that really wasn't too highly regarded in society. And, <clears throat> but hey, these guys are fun. Anything that looks like a woman uh, is, is, is a very exciting. Yeah, sing on, Ross. <clears throat> uh, but they were, they were a really popular, popular group and they carried on well after the war. Fascinating stuff. And this is sheet music, as, as you can gather. Uh, again, there are people who collect sheet music, uh, like that patriotic one earlier. I don't collect sheet music unless it's relevant to something else I collect. 
it sort of gives you another perspective on on the on the, the era, the context in, in which our ancestors lived. Yeah, we were in action too. And <clears throat> so there was a Canadian official set of postcards uh, mounting a parapet. And I don't think you'd want to send many of these home. I, I really don't. You, you might keep them yourself. Uh, or you might, when you were back in England, if you were wounded particularly, you might send this to say, you know, I'm not part of this any longer. Uh, this is Canada finds a little dog in Hun trenches and presents it to a nurse. So here's, but what I find interesting is uh, you, you have, of course, one guy puffing a cigarette, but, but this person, second from left, is, is, appears to be Oriental, but you remember that at the time the Japanese were on our side in the first war. So we didn't, we didn't intern him in a camp on the west coast, uh, he was out there fighting with, with our guys. And minor wounds, the fellow's got his hand bandaged, uh, but he's going to tough it out. Casualties, carrying them back. I mean, this wasn't MASH flying in by helicopter. Uh, if Again, if you had relatives wounded in, in the war, uh, they would come back on this, this sort of put together track uh, on a cart pulled by a horse. No, no emergency ambulances. Sorry about that. Uh, picture tells a thousand words. There were advantages to being an officer, as always. <clears throat> uh, officer care, you, you can see this picture, going to Blighty, uh, part of this official series. Two nurses, people fussing over him, and officers is the sign on the compartment of the train officers. Uh, whereas if you're an enlisted man, uh, you sort of look after yourself. I don't see a single nurse in the place. Uh, I see guys wounded, uh, a red cross on the train, uh, but you have to take your chances. <clears throat> the There's a person in the falls that uh, contact me. I had a display years ago at the museum there. And uh, he said he had <clears throat> couple of things from the Second War. And one was a menu from the Queen Elizabeth as a troop ship. <clears throat> so I met with him and I said, you want to keep these things? He said, no. He said, they're in a drawer. Anything happen when, when I pass away, it's just going to go in the garbage. And, and it's part of my memories. If it's going to stick with your things uh, and be part of a collection, that's where I want it to be. <clears throat> but it was an officer's menu, 1944. And he said, I've got to tell you, I wasn't an officer. I happened to pick this up. And I carried it with me to remind me how much better officers were. Because he said, when I was there, what happened was I was just one of the enlisted men. We didn't get a menu. We just lined up with our trays and they dumped stuff on it for we didn't get a choice. We just got what they were serving. So, um, same kind of thing here. Officers tend to do a little better. I talk about publications. Uh, this was something I came across uh, at a, actually I think it was in Stratford at the Antiques Mall there. The Times History and Encyclopedia of the War, price eight pence. This is part 179. So they would put these out every week. And, and you would need us to say want to pay eight pence to buy it. And there are a, a number of complete sets out there. This I was interested in because it's on a hospital ship. And so it's shipping. Uh, liners were converted to hospital ships. And this picture and a couple of others were done, again, to make the folks at home, whether it be back in England or anywhere else, feel good about, you know, if, if Fred is wounded, then he's going to be looked after with good care. He's going to maybe, maybe coming from uh, Gallipoli, somewhere like that. He's going to be in the sunshine on the deck of a ship. Uh, it looks, looks good. Uh, other things you find, I've said, look on the back. Uh, this I came across in a, an antique shop. And yeah, it's a Lapland. It's a contemporary frame. Sailed November 1st, 1916. Uh, it's, a, it's an oversized jumbo postcard. 
So you look at it and say, that's sort of neat. Then I turned it around. Message on the back. Mr. Creerar, RR1 Brighton. Uncle John Stuart Creerar sailed overseas on this ship. He was killed at Vimy Ridge, April 9, 1917. Uh, again, this isn't on the internet. You only find it by digging. Uh, the Creerar name is well known in the Canadian military. And I haven't done any digging to find out or contact anyone. Uh, but somebody in the family decided it wasn't worth keeping anymore. And, and that's unfortunate. Hospital ships, as I mentioned. There's the old Aquitania again. Part of the time she was a troop ship, part of the time she was a hospital ship. And, you know, a large for the time, one of the largest passenger liners. And uh, uh, you're not supposed to torpedo ships like this. Uh, a similar sized ship, the third one of the Titanic Olympic trio, was the Britannic which never saw passenger service. Uh, it was decked out like this when it hit a mine in the Mediterranean <clears throat> and sank. Another Titanic look-alike tragedy. Uh, on the Aquitania itself, uh, this, you find this stuff in the most amazing places. This is an Italian brochure in Italian, which I do not speak, but I can understand the Salon, well, probably the, the uh, main room of the Aquitania uh, act as a hospital. And you can see the absolutely elaborate fittings on the ship, which they probably haven't had time to cover up or remove, but they've made it as a hospital ward. And the whole ship would be like that, with nurses, the doctors on board. And it's, it's great to find things like this. Again, anyone who was on a, sh on a hospital ship who came from it. Uh, there's at least a picture you can say, yeah, that's, that's what they went through. Red Cross trains. This happens to be in Niagara on the Lake. Uh, you can see the apothecary down on the left there. And what I find interesting is this is a postcard. It's a color, po it's a real photograph card sepia finish and why would a red cross train i mean there was a hospital in niagara lake but why would it come there uh answer i don't know on the back dear gordon i received your card and thank you very much we will be marching into the city a week on monday and our battalion the 74th will lead oh boy it's so exciting uh this picture is a red cross train in niagara on the lake well goodbye for the present there's a postal cancellation. I can't read the date. It's Niagara Camp cancellation, so you know it's it's bona fide. Uh, this card, it's a long story, but it's a $240 postcard. At least it was about 20 years ago. Prices go up. Another shot of the Red Cross train. This is F.H. Leslie and Company in the Falls. Some of you will know the name. Major publisher. Published the, what's the newspaper, the Review? the Niagara Falls paper. Uh, they produced lots of postcards. This is from a booklet of 15 cards, uh, all of them with different views of the, of the first war and camp. Red Cross train leaving Niagara camp. And they, they sold a lot of these cards. <clears throat> it's hard to find them in the original booklet. But the problem in the booklet is you can't split the thing to take scans. So, uh, you look for the individual cards, which, so Judith has the booklet and uh, most of the individual cards as separate cards. Coming home. And again, if you wondered what it was like when one of your ancestors came back from the war, here's the Olympic with the 25th Battalion, May 16, 1919. Uh, and again, one of these beautiful things, time and place and context. FG, good enough to photograph, it would be in Halifax. Uh, we know the date, we know the, the group involved, the 25th Battalion, we know the ship. <clears throat> so from a genealogist's point of view, we can tie down, oh, you had somebody who came back and, and arrived in 
May 1919, probably part might be in this picture somewhere even, uh, although there's quite a few people. So it's, it's really quite remarkable what you find. It breaks my heart when people uh, break up family collections. There was a, a woman in Ingersoll who contacted us home, golly, 10 years ago, if that. Uh, and she had a bunch of family postcards. And I said, well, okay, she said, would you like to buy them? I said, well, it depends. So we met her in Woodstock at, uh, at Tim Hortons. Uh, what a great meeting spot. Everybody knows where the local Tim Hortons is. And she had about 800 postcards. They were early 1900s. The one branch of the family had had gone out to the U.S. West Coast and worked in Oregon for a couple of years in mining in southern Oregon in the Rogue, Rogue River area. Great photographs of the Rogue River and environments, outcovered bridges, uh, little ferry boats crossing rough rivers. And I said, well, and there's messages on the back of most of them. Because what happened was they sent cards out to people in Oregon. The people in Oregon sent cards here. When the people in Oregon came back a few years later, they brought all those cards with them. So this had all those cards. Family history in a nutshell. And I said, well, what about your family? Um, you know, this is, this is part of your heritage. She said, the kids don't want them. I've asked them. They have no interest whatsoever. Why would I want a bunch of old postcards? So she said, I'm selling them and I'm giving the proceeds to sleeping children around the world as a charitable, so this is my charitable project. <clears throat> Needless to say, I bought them. I was saying to, maybe it was Brian, uh, the first 16 of these 800 cards, I sold to a woman who collected Norfolk County, and I got all my money back on those 16 cards. Uh, a bunch of them were doing, are now in the Oregon Historical Society Museum in Portland. Uh, we donated them. You can find it on their website. They were skeptical like I was initially. So I've got some Oregon cards. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Figuring they're like 50s, 40s. These were fabulous cards. Once they saw them, they went ecstatic. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, it's a pity because those things are now broken up. That her family history is all over the place. Uh, if she wants, if somebody wants to recapture that two generations from now, they got to go to postcard shows and just hope beyond hope that they can piece some of this back together again. So it's, it's unfortunate when people have a heritage and they really just can't, they, they can't keep it together because the family doesn't want to keep it together. <clears throat> so uh, here I go preaching to the converted, but uh, you, you know where we what we're all about. So here we are, the ship that brought me home. Can you picture what it would be like? You, you're on, you've just gotten off the ship and you want to write this to the folks at home. Here we are, left Southampton on June 7th, arrived all by June 13th, Canadian Expeditionary Force. I've made it, I've made it, I've made it. And I particularly love, I resonate to things of the ship that brought me home. Uh, there's American versions of it as well. I've even got a few printed handkerchiefs. <clears throat> Picture of the ship, the ship that brought me home. And I wrote a piece on this for uh, a magazine in the States. I got an email from a woman in Iowa who said, I was cleaning out the attic of this house I'm renting, and I came across some rags, and one of them was this, this handkerchief. And it was the Leviathan ship that brought me home. Uh, two questions. What's it worth? And who might, who, who might buy it? <clears throat> well, I mean, I could answer the second question. Uh, first question, really, because Leviathan was, was quite a good ship from a ship collector's point of view. Uh, <clears throat> so I think I said, well, I could, I'd pay you 50 bucks for it. Uh, what do you think? Email back. Send the money, I'll send the... So uh, so I added this to my collection of the ship that brought me home. 
But imagine, it's in Iowa. So somebody brought it home, gave it to the love of his life back in Iowa, and, and she kept it. And it ended up, obviously, in an estate up in the attic upstairs. Uh, amazing stuff and, and amazing. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's it's sort of saying, you know, it's, oh, this might be someone who'd gone through much of it. And boy, if you'd gone through much of it and, and you were on the ship home, you'd be sort of, phew. Uh, I mean, I made it. I made it. And a combination of exultation, exhaustion, um, everything. Just really wonderful. People brought home souvenirs, and this pin is HMT Olympic, His Majesty's Transport. It's not HMS, which would be a peacetime one. Uh, total deployment. Uh, we put out 619,000 men, lost 10% of them. This doesn't include the Newfoundlanders who weren't part of this. Uh, and 172,000 wounded. So, again, a terrible toll, uh, but we weren't alone. I mean, other countries had the same kind of losses. But for Canada, it's it really quite significant. So there you are. We've gone from Niagara camp to Europe. We've come back again. <clears throat> and through it all, uh, trails that might suggest how you can do some more digging. Get your hands dirty and, and go looking at stuff. We love it. I mean, it's just part of us. But And that's all, folks. Thank you. And I have, if you're thinking of going to postcard shows, I happen to have a picture. I made up this thing. First is the picture of the card that Judith, that got the got her hairs on her neck shaking. Uh, I'm just, you can handle those. And then, and these are postcard shows that are coming up. The closest one is, is in town. Uh, and it's in, uh, but it's January. It's at the, uh, the hall, Lions Hall, down at uh, uh, Bunting and, uh, and Lakeshore. And if you, your, your best website is probably the Toronto Postcard Club site because it'll give you all of this stuff. Uh, it's, it's a very good site. I don't keep it, so I'm not patting myself on the back. But the people who do, uh, who do keep it are, are very conscientious about, about this, what they do and how they do it. So here's a list. You can put it in your calendar if you want. Uh, they're all good shows. There's only two dealers at the St. Catharines show. But they're the best dealers. Uh, Ron Workman, who lives about five blocks, probably from here, uh, is a local dealer who has great stuff. And uh, another one, Frank Hoyles, who comes from Blenheim, uh, and and sets up. So we have. Ex I'll leave. I'll leave the rest with uh, with Brian, uh, if it's if somebody wants some more, um, or for another meeting. Steve, what's, uh, where are we going from here? All right. Has anybody got any questions or we can, uh, for our speaker, or we can go into, and then we can just do some general. Uh, about 250 bucks, I think. Well, yeah. <clears throat> at the time, it wasn't that cheap, and they weren't all great cards. But, but there were some that were. Uh, and I didn't, you know, there were only a few I collected that were in there. There were no Niagara Camp, no Niagara on the Lake, and a few Ocean Liner ones. But the rest, you know, I've, I've said to people, one of my jobs is to save things from the Philistines, which means having things go to people who won't, don't appreciate it, can't use it, or worse still, go into landfill. And so you, you do what you can when you can. Oh, yeah. Uh, we know John. I've known John for a long time. John has some great material. And he's been collecting 
Niagara for much longer. We had it as he's been here all that time. Uh, ocean liners for me is like 40 years. And Niagara for John is about 40 years at least. So, but we're two different channels. You know, but yeah, we bump into John and we are also the one like his lane is going to So, John was present at yeah, I'm going to go and talk about this. We're going to find somebody that can really be talked about the uh, database. Yeah. And I just found out my ancestors just very short. So my first time with 3000 Life was from St. Catherine's. And my mother, Maria Medici, was in the database. Wow. I'm just going I have no problem sharing any of these things. But yeah, that's the kind of thing you see. You, you have to get up here and see things. And then start Absolutely. Absolutely. We always like people who are willing to share. But not everybody's just going to rush them. I'm going to get them first. <laughs> no. But thank you very kindly on behalf of the branch. We do thank you very much. you both coming down. And uh, Brian, we'll see you uh, before you leave. Yeah. Oops. Super. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so, all. Thank you. You kill. Yeah. Uh, just want to say to those who are online, we just want to thank you for joining us. And uh, you will find this and other videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you cannot watch it tonight, uh, they will they will remain there. So great if we can stop running. Okay, it's off. <laughs>